Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm really happy about today. My name is Jen Clark. I'm from the benefits team, and I work on the OYL program. Um, this is part of the Health That Speaker series, which is aimed at providing information to Googlers um, about health and wellness topics. Um, I've got a slide up there that tells you a little bit more. Uh, we welcome your feedback on any of these topics, so if you have some, pl please feel free to go to Health That Survey. Um, for more information on OYL, uh, please check out go to OYL. Um, and if you're interested in planning and being involved in these types of talks, uh, please check out go to Wellness Champions. Um, and I'm particularly excited because Brandon uh, was a classmate of mine at the Stanford Graduate School of Business about uh, four or five years ago. Um, and he's now taking his experience as a physician um, and as someone with business uh, training in um, exploring ways to use business and health together. Um, so I'm really excited to have him here. Uh, a little bit of background on Brandon. Dr. Brandon Colby is a world leader in the field of predictive medicine, a groundbreaking medical specialty that combines comprehensive genetic testing with personalized prevention based upon your genes. Dr. Colby has been involved in the genetics field for his entire life, first as a patient, then as a researcher, and now as a practicing physician. He has conducted extensive research in the field of advanced clinical genetic analysis, inventing numerous patent-pending technologies that make comprehensive genetic screening understandable, useful, and empowering to both the physician and the patient. Dr. Colby is also the only practicing physician in the world to have designed a first-of-its-kind DNA chip, which I believe you all will see later. Um, in addition to serving as the medical director of Existence Health, a predictive medicine pra private practice based in Los Angeles. Dr. Colby is also the founder and CEO of Ex Existence Genetics, a company that provides highly advanced predictive medicine services to the healthcare industry. He holds a degree in genetics from the University of Michigan Honors Program, an MD from the Mount Sinai School of Medicine, and an MBA from the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Colby. Thank you, Jen. Today is an incredibly important day for our civilization. And it's important because we stand right at the point of transition between the age of information and the age of personalization. So we're moving from this information age where we now have an unprecedented amount of access to information. Basically, our world's accumulated knowledge of information is accessible to anyone at any time from anywhere for practically no cost. And we're moving from access to this information, from this generic information, to now personalizing it and making it about a unique person, about each of us in unique ways. And the fundamental underpinning of how information is made to be personalized, on how each of us is unique, is our genes. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, gaining access to our genes through genetic testing, understanding what that means, and then using that information to personalize products and services. Since I'm a doctor, I'm going to talk about how we could use that information to personalize healthcare. But this is applicable to really any product and service that we could think of. And in the future, we're going to start to see a genetically tailored world that all products and services are, start, start, are going to start to be tailored to our genes. They're going to be personalized. So to begin, I'm going to walk you through an example that we're all going to participate in. And for some of you, it may help to close your eyes. For others, let's just imagine that we're standing in a dark room. And the room is so dark, we can't even see our hand in front of our face. All of a sudden, we feel something come up and kick us in the back of the leg. We turn around, we try to defend ourselves, but we can't, because we don't know what's attacking us, we don't know when it's going to come again, and we feel something go and punch us in the stomach. We try to defend ourselves again, but we can, and again, we get hit in the head. Now, I know this seems like an awkward situation, but this is actually the current state of healthcare, that we're in practically the dark ages. We don't know what diseases may lay ahead. We don't know what we may be faced with. And we don't know when they may come and attack us. Now imagine that we're back in that room again. It's very dark. We can't see. 
and somebody places something into our hands, a tool, but we don't know whether that tool is going to help us, whether we'll be able to use that to defend ourselves, or potentially if that tool is going to harm us. And that's the current state of a lot of the treatments that we receive, a lot of the medications that are prescribed to us. We don't know if they're going to be effective. We don't know if they're potentially going to harm us. And the person who hands you that tool in that room is your doctor, your physician. And their eyesight, our eyesight is not much better than yours. That we can't really make out what's ahead. We use family history to try to guess at what diseases you may be predisposed to. We ask you questions like if you've ever had an allergic reaction before to try to guess at medications that we don't want to give you. But other than that, our eyesight is really not much better. We can make out shadows, but we don't really know what is there. We don't know what diseases lay ahead for you. And because of that, we can't really prevent anything from coming and attacking you. Now, we talked about um, uh, this uh, model, so healthcare, uh, in terms of being in the dark ages. What predictive medicine does, which is combining genetic testing with the personalized prevention of disease, is that it turns the light on. It allows us, through genetic testing, to examine an individual's genes to see what diseases they may be predisposed to, and then to enact preventions before those diseases ever manifest. So it's turning the light on in the room, allowing us to see what's lurking in those shadows, allows us to best take preemptive measures to either prevent that disease from ever attacking us, or if we see it coming towards us, because now that light on is, the light is on in the room, we could take steps to make sure and it has the smallest amount of impact upon us possible. And also, genetic testing allows us to know whether medications, whether certain treatments, even lifestyle modifications, as we'll discuss, whether those will help slow down or prevent disease. So we're uh, moving now from standing in this very dark room to turn in on the light, to be able to turn on the light through genetic testing and predictive medicine. So let's move on to the next example and actually walk through a person's life and see how this could impact somebody today. Because everything we're going to discuss in this entire talk is possible today. So let's say today a baby is born, baby Emily. She's born completely healthy. It was a normal childhood, teenage years, no problem. She gets through her 20s, she's fine. She turns 30, she begins to start a family, and all of a sudden, she goes and has a massive heart attack. She's in the intensive care unit for about two weeks, and then unfortunately she dies. Now her parent, her, I'm sorry, her physicians did absolutely nothing wrong. So the physicians practice medicine as they're taught, that they treated her like a, a, generic, uh, a generic patient. At, uh, throughout her teenage years, throughout her 20s, Hardly ever does a doctor closely examine somebody's heart because most people that age, their hearts are fine. But Emily was unique, as all of us are. She was unique. She contained genes that were predisposing her to early onset heart attack, and her doctors just had no idea. They were standing in that dark room. And that's why a heart attack was able to go and manifest, that her cholesterol built up, it was never detected, and she had that heart attack. So now we have tremendous heartache. A family has lost a loved one. We have doctors who were powerless to protect their patient's life. And we also have society that now has spent a tremendous amount of money on this ICU care and the intensive care unit uh, and lost a productive member of their community at the end. So let's say a slightly different scenario. Uh, Emily is in the intensive care unit. Uh, she's able to be saved, and her doctors go and prescribe a medication, a medication that they give to a lot of people in this situation, and they treat Emily again like a generic patient. They start her at 5 milligrams. Everybody who receives this blood thinner receives it at 5 milligrams, and most of us are used to that. When uh, our doctor prescribes us medications, it's at the same dose that you know that they've given to the last person and they'll give to the next person. But for Emily, she's extremely sensitive to this medication. 
Her doctors had no idea. They didn't want to cause any harm, but they thinned her blood so much with that five milligrams that she ended up bleeding into her brain and she died again. So again, we have the loss of life, we have the heartache, and we have the loss to society in terms of spending a tremendous amount of money and now actually causing more harm than, than good. So now the model of predictive medicine, of using genetic testing to predict disease, we could go all the way to when Emily is born. Genetic testing is so simple now, it doesn't even require any blood. So her parents choose to have genetic testing for Emily. They collect some of her saliva with her pediatrician. They send that for testing and analysis, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And the doctor gets back the report and sees that Emily contains genes that predispose her to early onset heart attack. And again, this is possible now. So the doctor makes note of that. There's not much to be done right at that age, right when she's a baby. But when she enters her teenage years, her doctors do something differently. They start to pay attention to her heart because that light has been turned on in the room. They know that heart disease is lurking in the shadows. So they start doing blood tests. They start monitoring her cholesterol levels, different biomarkers. And when she gets to about 18 or 19, they see that her cholesterol levels start to go up. So the doctors go and work with her, go over her genetic report in terms of lifestyle modifications. Let's not start medications right now, they say. Let's focus on lifestyle modifications. So they're able to go and tailor her cardiovascular exercise to her genes so that she's able to optimize what are going to be the most effective exercises for her. They're also able to go and start to tailor some of her nutrition. So they talk about some of the generic things that we're told uh, in terms of low-fat diet, staying away from refined sugars. But then they also tell her that based upon her genetic profile, eating a specific type of vegetable, cruciferous vegetables, likely to be very beneficial to her in helping to cut down her heart attack risk. And they also see from her genetic report that she's likely not to like the taste of these vegetables. And based upon taste bud genes, uh, those vegetables are likely to taste really bitter to her. So they tell her different methods to, uh, to still eat those vegetables, but avoid that bitter taste, such as mixing them with other foods. So as you see, they're completely tailoring these lifestyle recommendations to her genes to make them as effective as possible. So now Emily is able to go and integrate this into her lifestyle. She slows down the progression of disease uh, significantly. But then in her mid-30s, her doctors still are, are, are very uh, conscientiously monitoring her blood. They see her cholesterol levels increasing again. Uh, so at that time, the doctors say, all right, we have to go and, and start to in, uh, integrate in some medications. That the genes are just overriding the lifestyle modifications. We were able to slow down the process, but now we need medications. We need something stronger. Say, so look at the genetic profile that was taken when Emily was just a child. And they see that she is very sensitive to a medication they're about to prescribe. So instead of giving 5 milligrams, they give 0 0.5 milligrams. Emily is able to avoid a heart attack. She's able to raise a family, have grandchildren, and live a full life. Now the doctors are able to focus in on what's important for Emily and also provide the most effective preventions and treatments. So they've been a success too. And our society now has gained a productive member of the community throughout her entire life. And they focus all of the healthcare spending on that which matters most and that which is going to be most effective. So that is what genetic testing now allows. It allows us to turn on that light uh, for healthcare. It allows us to go and move from our current model of healthcare, which is really more like sick care. Most of us just wait until we get sick and then we see a doctor. We wait for disease to occur and then we go and we diagnose and doctors hope that they could treat. But what this new model, this genetic testing, this personalization of healthcare allows us to do is actually go and move to a different paradigm where we focus on the proactive, personalized prevention of disease throughout a person's life.
Now, we've been talking about genetic testing, uh, in, and it's a bit nebulous uh, to people in terms of what exactly genetic testing is. And genetic testing is really a generic term that people use to refer to three things, or three components of genetic technology. Uh, the first is testing, so that's the acquisition of raw data. Uh, the second is analysis, or clinical analysis, that's transitioning that data, translating it from this raw data into an actionable information state. And the third is reporting, is actually delivering that to the end user. We'll talk about each one of those now. So the first component, just get to the slide. Okay, great, thank you. So the first component is testing. Uh, and testing is acquiring all the raw data, all the letters of our genetic code. And this involves a lot of hardware. So it uh, involves laboratory function. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about two of the types of technology that allows us to undergo this, this genetic testing. But let's take a step back and think about where testing was about 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, to look at a single gene, one gene may have cost five, 10, or even $20,000, and it would have taken months for that to be turned around. And almost always, you had to go and give blood, so it was invasive. Now, with this new technology that we'll discuss first, called a DNA chip, or a microarray, that's a generic term. Now, with this new technology, we don't have to look at just one gene, we can look at thousands of genes all at the same time for just a few hundred dollars. So it's been a major uh, inflection point in terms of how much we're able to do uh, for much more uh, cost-effective price point. Uh, and also, all we have to do right now is really use saliva. We do not need to use blood anymore. So it's become non-invasive. And uh, this is a picture of one uh, type of gene chip of, uh, of a DNA chip. This is the one that uh, I uh, spent about six years creating, called the Nexus DNA chip. This is uh, the actual uh, chip itself. Uh, so one of these uh, is used to process 12 different samples. And you could come up and take a look at this after, but this is just so that you guys have an idea of the scale, uh, that it's, it's quite small. And what this does is it allows us to look at thousands of genes all at the same time. Uh, and it skips over all of the irrelevant information. So this is one gene. And you could think of uh, all the letters. So all of those are different GPS coordinates. Uh, and only those that are in red are known to be associated with some clinical state. They have some relevancy. All the other data is just uh, extraneous. Even if we had it, we wouldn't do anything with it. So what a DNA chip allows us to do is hone in, zero in on those that are red, and test those in the individual. So we're testing several uh, different letters in one gene, then we move on to the next gene, and the next, and the next. So we're skipping over all that is superfluous. We're focusing in on that which is most important. Now, the Nexus DNA chip is specific for predictive medicine purposes. There are different chips out there. This one is specific for really protecting a person's health, for detecting disease risk, and then finding out what's gonna be the most effective preventions. And this has really unlocked this new error, this genetic revolution, our ability now to move towards personalization it's because of this technology, which is just a few hundred dollars. Now there's a new technology that's currently in development it's moving along quite rapidly called whole genome sequencing. Uh, many of us are probably familiar with the Human Genome Project. So that took about 10 years. It was completed in 2003, uh, and it cost about $3 billion to accomplish. It required an international team of scientists. So 2003, $3 billion, and that was all to sequence a single person. 
And whole genome sequencing means that you're getting six billion letters per person. So that the DNA chip may acquire tens of thousands to millions of letters. This new technology acquires every single letter. So it acquires both the black and the red. It doesn't distinguish. It just gets the entire sequence. And that's six billion letters per person. So what uh, costs $3 billion and took 10 years and ended in 2003, today could be done for $4,000 and takes, takes about a month. That's projected to come down quite rapidly all the way to the $500, $100 mark, and soon probably under a day, maybe even an hour, where we'll be able to go and accumulate all of this data. As we see from the DNA chip, where it's getting tens of thousands to millions of relevant data points to whole genome sequencing that's getting six billion. It's an avalanche of data. It's a tremendous amount of raw data that we have to deal with right now. And that's where the next component comes in. That's, that's clinical analysis. So that's why moving from testing to analysis is really important. And we'll talk about that in a moment, but first, how relevant is whole genome sequencing to us? And this chart shows the decreasing cost. So the lines that are in red and black and green are different costs of this technology of whole genome sequencing. The line that's in blue is a number of people who have had their genome sequenced, number of just individuals. So by the end of this year, we'll be somewhere uh, around 50,000. It's projected to be around that. If we think uh, to about uh, 2014 or so, we're looking at closer to 10 to 100 million. We look at 2020, we're looking at close to a billion genomes, a billion people having their entire sequence deduced. So a billion people and six billion letters per person. So it, it's just a, a tremendous avalanche of data. And now the question arises, what do we do with all that data? How do we make sense of that? And that's really what my team and I specialize in. It's clinical analysis and reporting of this tremendous amount of raw data that's now able to be accumulated using this new technology. And what clinical analysis does is it translate the data from just raw data into actionable, meaningful information. It allows value to be attributed to that. Because without analysis, all those letters of a person's genome are really nothing more than a high-tech paperweight. That uh, it's not even a paperweight now because you could fit that on a small thumb drive, so it's, it's quite light. But none of that is really important to a person's health unless that, inf that data is translated into information. Now, I'm going to go through one example of a clinical analysis technology just so that you have some idea of what I'm talking about when I refer to analysis. Let's think back to uh, the baby Emily example, that she has genetic testing. Uh, she's found to be at increased risk of a heart attack. Uh, then I uh, also mentioned that different medications uh, are analyzed. So that means that different genes are looked at after a heart attack is, is risk is detected. Different genes are analyzed in relation to different preventions and treatments associated with heart attack. Different lifestyle modifications, like the cruciferous vegetables and whether that taste uh, is, uh, that Emily's going to enjoy the taste or not, those genes are analyzed. So it's a whole nother set. All different sets of genes then are analyzed after that initial uh, center node, uh, that center disease. And we could see a flow chart here that goes the first round, a risk of heart attack is deduced. Then the reflex analysis comes in. And this is all software based. So we move from the testing, which is hardware, to now the clinical analysis, which is software. So the software is doing this, that it's, it's programmed specifically to be able to do this analysis. It moves from this first round to the second round which looks at different medications, whether they're going to be effective, whether somebody is going to be sensitive to them. It also looks at different lifestyle modifications. We could even now start to provide some information about whether surgeries, like a coronary artery bypass graft, is going to be effective or not. 
that's still in the preliminary stages while these other information now is, is in the much more advanced stage. And then the third round of analysis, we could go even deeper. So we could start to look at specific dosing for some of the medications. That's where we look at whether uh, the person is going to like the taste of vegetables. We look at things that are associated with exercise. And reflex analysis really goes as deep as, as needed in order to get all of these reflexes, all of these different sets of genes analyzed. And the whole purpose is to make that anal analysis now integrated which makes it much more actionable. And we'll see that as it's presented in the genetic report in a few minutes. And this allows us to analyze a tremendous amount of data all at once, so all together. Instead of thinking about it in a two-dimensional way, this allows us to analyze things three-dimensionally. And this is uh, a computer software that we created to enable this reflex analysis. So that it enables us to go and set up these types of reflexes uh, underlying each of the nodes that you see is a whole set of diseases, whole sets of algorithms for analyzing each one of those traits or conditions or medications. But this allows our IT system to know to analyze one, then to reflex to another one, and then potentially another one and another one. So we've talked about uh, testing, so the acquiring the raw data. And we talked about analysis, moving that data into useful understandable information. And the third point, the third part is really key because without proper reporting, that testing, which may be extremely accurate and then an analysis, which may be beautiful, without proper reporting, then it's all useless, it's, it's all wasted. If the end user can easily understand what that data means and can integrate that beneficially into their life, then all the value is lost. So the third step is reporting. And there are many different types of report formats out there. Uh, one is not better than the other. Uh, it's just really dependent upon what you, the, the end user, wants to get out of genetic testing. So I'm going to go over one of the types of reports. Uh, this is the report that my team and I uh, have come up with over the past five years. Uh, but it's just important to note that there are many different types of report formats that are out there now. So this is a report format for heart attack risk. This is the actual report uh, that's, that's printed. Uh, so this is uh, delivered. It would be delivered, let's say, to Emily's pediatrician. And this is a report page that talks about heart attack. It's actually two pages because there's so many medications now associated with heart disease that we could provide information about when we do genetic testing. So right at the top, we see three gauges. The gauge right in the center is, is risk. So this person is at high risk, uh, and it says specifically about 67% risk. We like to focus more on the qualitative on these zones. So they're in the zone of high risk. And that is based upon an analysis of many different genes. And it's also compared right below it to what's called a generic population risk. That's uh, the everyday risk for a person if they have no idea what their genes contain. It's just taken off of mass population studies. Let's say how many people uh, around this age, with this ethnicity, with this gender, are likely to have this disease. And for heart attacks, uh, for a Caucasian male, it's around 47% lifetime risk. For this person, based upon their genes, it's closer to 70% risk. So they're at high risk. Now, there are two other gauges. The gauge on the left uh, is the clinical significance gauge. And that's there so that a person understands, is this information even relevant to their health? Because there are some diseases or conditions that they may be really at high risk for, but it's not going to impact them significantly. It's not going to cause them a lot of harm. It's not going to be something that they really have to focus on or worry about. So if in the report there are some things that are very high clinical significance and high risk. And there are other things that are very low clinical significance but high risk. They know to focus on the ones that are more significant. They know then able, they're able to differentiate. And their healthcare provider is able to differentiate also and say, okay, this one is much more important. Let's focus on this. 
And for a heart attack, it's very significant to somebody's health. If somebody has a heart attack, they could die, uh, which is why it has a high clinical significance. Now, the last gauge, the one on the right, is actionability. So even if somebody comes back at high risk for something, and it's very clinically significant, if there's low actionability, there's nothing that could be done about it, then again, what's the point? So we really focus on the conditions, diseases that have either moderate or high actionability. So actionability means that we can implement preventions, such as lifestyle modifications, medications, complementary medicine therapies, uh, and even different screening exams. We could implement these and either prevent the disease outright or slow it down significantly so that it manifests much later and that physicians now know to be on the lookout for these so that it's detected at its earliest stages and able to be treated much more effectively. So that's the actionability gauge. Now, about 60% uh, of this heart attack page is devoted to actionability, to actually describing what can be done with this information. So that gauge says that actionability is high. Now, what do we do with that in order to make it actionable. And that's a section that we call genetically tailored prevention. So this is prevention where many of the recommendations here are based on a person's genes. Uh, and we see uh, in the lifestyle modifications one, the second from the last bullet point, is that cruciferous vegetable example that we talked about with Emily. And there are other uh, recommendations uh, within this genetically tailored prevention section that's on the screen now that are based upon an analysis of a person's genes using reflex analysis. So we see now through the testing acquired data, the analysis analyzed it in this integrated way and the reporting is able to present it in a very integrated way that makes for it rapid, uh, rapid understanding and very easy for a person to go and integrate this into their life and to benefit from this information as well as their healthcare provider to use this information to change their clinical management and really provide much more personalized services. So what we've seen now that genetic technology has those three components, the testing, the analysis, and the reporting. Now, where can you get genetic testing? Let's say you're interested in genetic testing where can you go to actually access your genes and to learn what you could do to protect your health? And there are many different places. So the first is the internet. You could go and have direct-to-consumer genetic testing, which means you don't need a professional involved. You could go to a website. You could pay for a service and they will send you the uh, collection kit uh, just for saliva. You send them back some of your saliva and in about three or four weeks, you get your results online. Now, the other way to get it is through a healthcare professional or a health and wellness organization. And there's no right way or wrong way. It's really based upon your personal preference, what you feel is best for yourself and what you hope to get out of this testing process. So you could also go through your doctor who could go and, and uh, perform this testing, collect the saliva, receive the report, and then work with you to integrate that information into your clinical care so that it changes the way that they're providing their care and also they're able to counsel you on that information uh, so that you know what's best to integrate into, into your lifestyle uh, and into your daily habits. Now, part of that also is health and wellness organizations. Uh, so beyond just healthcare providers, health and wellness organizations like nutritionists, weight loss centers, and even fitness centers are starting to use genetic testing. I'm going to walk you through a process uh, so you could understand from beginning to end what's involved when I say genetic testing. So let's say you want genetic testing and you're interested in having it through a health and wellness uh, organization. You can actually have genetic testing now through Equinox Fitness. I'm sure many of us are familiar with Equinox right in Palo Alto on El Camino Real. So they are providing genetic testing services through their trainers and the genetic testing is meant to optimize fitness and also work to prevent some exercise related diseases and conditions. 
So you're interested in genetic testing, you go to Equinox, you meet with one of their fitness coaches, and you say you're interested in genetic testing, and you talk about it with them, and they provide you with a saliva collection kit. This is uh, an actual saliva collection kit. So basically, you just spit into this kit, uh, and uh, this then goes to a laboratory where it gets processed on a DNA chip. Then a report is generated. This is a, one of the sample Equinox reports. So the report's generated, and it contains information that's specific for the person who's ordering it. So for a fitness trainer, this only really contains information that is specific for them as a fitness trainer that will help them help you optimize your fitness and athletic performance. So they get this report back, they review the report, and they meet with you, and they discuss ways that they're going to integrate this into your fitness. One of the ways is that they see that you're predisposed to endurance-based activities. So while you may have been doing power-based, so power is very high intensity but low durations of time, while you may have been doing that in the past and seeing limited gains, now you can focus more on what your genes are predisposing you to. So you can focus on endurance-based which is much lower intensity but longer periods of time. Instead of 10, 15 minute intervals, you're working out or doing cardiovascular exercise for, for 30, 45, 60 minute intervals. So they're able now to tailor and personalize their services to your genes. But beyond that, they also learn that you're predisposed to osteoporosis. That's another page that's in here that provides osteoporosis risk. So while a lot of women go and osteoporosis manifests around the time of menopause, so in the 50s and late 50s, the bone loss, the thinning of the bone that, that leads to osteoporosis, it starts in their, in their late, uh, late 20s, early 30s. So uh, by learning about osteoporosis risk, a trainer is able to identify a person uh, who would benefit from resistance training. So that's doing more weight-bearing exercises. And a lot of women who are in their teenage years and 20s and 30s, they don't do any resistance training, or they do it very sporadically, because they just want to focus on cardiovascular exercise. So now the trainer knows how important it is for this specific person to do weight, weight training, and they counsel that person on the importance of integrating weight training into, into their exercise regimen. They integrate it into the training themselves, and now this person is able to go and fortify their bones, so strengthen their bones, especially the ones in the lower back, the hips, the wrist, the upper arm, through uh, specific exercises that they're now doing with their trainer throughout their 20s and 30s, 40s. By the time they get to their 50s, those bones are fortified. They're stronger. And now osteoporosis won't occur for, for decades. So the trainer has actually helped that person go and avoid osteoporosis by integrating by integrating in exercises that previously uh, that person may have been hesitant to do, and that trainer may have said, oh, okay, I don't want to push this person because, because they seem more focused on cardiovascular exercise, so I'll just go with that. So it provides guidance. Now, it also goes and allows us to take away certain exercises. On the next page after osteoporosis, it provides an analysis of arthritis risk. Arthritis, uh, separately, it's analyzed in the knees, in the hips, and in the wrist as well. So the genetic report comes back, and the uh, fitness trainer sees that the person is predisposed to knee arthritis, very high risk of knee arthritis. So they start to pull that person away from activities that have impact upon the knee. Instead of telling that person to jog, instead of saying that it's all right to go run on that treadmill for 30 minutes after, after we're done with our session, they're saying, Okay, now you have to avoid jogging. You have to cut down the treadmill or exclude that uh, totally. Instead, focus your cardiovascular exercise on the elliptical, on biking, or on swimming. So while for osteoporosis, they are integrating in specific exercises, now they're pulling away and they're changing around and modifying their plan uh, so that they're avoiding causing more harm to this individual. So instead of that person growing up and and by the time they're 50, their knees are completely gone, and by the time they're 55 or 60, they need a knee replacement surgery. 
Now we're preserving that knee function. We're allowing that person to age healthy uh, so that when they get to their 50s, when they get to their 60s, their knees are in much better shape. So that's how this information is being used today uh, by a health and wellness organization, by Equinox. So we've identified a major problem with our healthcare system, that we're in the dark ages, that we don't really know how to personalize our services to the individual. We're just treating people as generic objects. But we also have a solution, which is genetic testing. And through that solution, we're able to go and personalize the field of healthcare. And the last question that arises is, why is this important now? Why do you need this now? And it's a three-part answer. The first is that we need to integrate genetic testing and predictive medicine into our healthcare system now because our healthcare system, our sick care system, which is true of the entire world, is unsustainable. It's no different than our reliance on fossil fuels, that we need to move to a new renewable, sustainable model of fuel, and we need to do the same thing with healthcare. We need to find a new, renewable, sustainable model, one that focuses not on the defensive aspect of just treating disease once it occurs, but instead on the proactive prevention of disease. And that's what genetic testing now allows. So we can't wait 20 years, we can't wait 10 years. Too much of the world's GDP of every single country is devoted towards healthcare costs. It doesn't matter if the model is, is the American one or the Canadian or the one in Europe. It doesn't matter what healthcare cost it is, it's still a tremendous portion of the GDP and it's only skyrocketing. So it's unsustainable and we need the new model and we need to start enacting that now because it's going to take time for it, to, for it to spread throughout medicine, for other specialties to go and to adopt it. That's why we have to start now, to save our entire healthcare system. Now the second reason why we need this now is to save ourselves. Now, prevention is most effective when it started early. And we have extremely good tools now. We have excellent testing, we have great analysis, and we have really amazing reporting. So we have the tools now to identify risk, to start preventions, and the earlier preventions are started, the more effective they are in preventing a disease. As an example, a tragic example, there was a high school basketball player his name was Wes Leonard. Earlier this year, he was playing basketball. He went up for the game-winning shot. He made the shot. He won the game for his team. He went in the locker room. He was celebrating. This is a high school basketball player celebrating, and all of a sudden, he collapses and he dies. Upon autopsy, the doctors find that he had a condition called dilated cardiomyopathy. Now, the doctors didn't do anything wrong. They didn't go and miss this. It's just they weren't looking for it. They didn't know that in this teenager they had to go and assess his heart because the majority of teenagers, their hearts are fine. Doctors don't worry about the heart until the late 30s or 40s, even 50s. But for Wes Leonard, he had a gene, possibly had a gene. They haven't done genetic testing on him, but it's very likely that this condition was caused by, by a, a genetic abnormality. So he had this underlying a condition, dilated cardiomyopathy, that went undiagnosed. And that's what led to his death. Now, I frequently test patients for this condition and a large number of other preventable sudden cardiac death. So I test them on a genetic level using this Nexus DNA chip, using just saliva. At the same time, we're looking at all the risks for different types of cancers and heart disease. We're looking also at preventable causes of sudden death. I've detected dilated cardiomyopathy in patients. I've detected other sudden death diseases that are preventable. They all have complicated names like long QT syndrome and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and, and arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. So I've detected these in people. They go and they see a cardiologist and preventions, very simple for preventions, usually just medications. Low-cost medications are enacted and sudden death is avoided. So in Wes Leonard's case, one thing that could have saved him was if he had genetic testing, 
And as you see, it, he could not wait for that. It's not like he could have waited a year, five years. He needed it last year. So this is not only applicable to preventable sudden cardiac death, it's also applicable to all different types of cancer, from breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, skin cancer, such as melanoma. It's uh, applicable to heart disease. It's even applicable to Alzheimer's disease, where we have different interventions we can enact throughout life, which has been shown to decrease either the risk of that disease or greatly delay its onset. So we have that ability today. Now, the third reason why this is so important, why we need this now, is to save our future generations. So genetic testing now allows us to identify what diseases we carry in our genes. And by carry, I mean that we may not have that disease. We most likely don't have that disease. We have no way of knowing that we carry it. These are rare diseases, rare recessive diseases like cystic fibrosis, Tay-Sachs disease, Canavan's disease, or sickle cell anemia. So we have no idea that we may carry these diseases. But if we have a child with somebody who also carries the same disease, then there's a high likelihood that the child will have that disease. That's why we, we see often people will have a child and that child will have a disease and the parents will say, I had no idea that I carried this. It, it's never manifested in my family before. This is the first time. But through genetic testing, we can now identify what diseases we carry. And geneticists postulate that each person carries probably about three to four rare diseases. So each of us in this room right now are carrying three to four rare diseases. Do you know which ones they are? Do you know if your spouse, or that person that you're going to have a child with, also carries those diseases? Using gene chip technology, so this uh, Nexus DNA chip, at first we could screen for a handful, and now we could screen for hundreds. Just recently, we enabled this to screen for thousands of rare diseases, over a thousand rare diseases all at the same time. So we could start to identify who's carrying what disease. It doesn't mean that anything's wrong with a person, it just means that now they could take proactive steps to protect their future generations. And there are clear things that they could do to protect their future generation from inheriting a deadly disease if both they carry it and their spouse or whoever they're going to have a child with also carries that disease. So it allows us to save our healthcare system, save ourselves, and to save future generations all today. And this is all possible because we have this inflection point with the technology. So the testing now has come down tremendously in price. It's unlocked a way to access all of our genes. We have ways to analyze and understand this because we have 30 years of research, 30 years of genetic research of looking at what genes are associated with what, what disease. But up until this technology, that research has only been relegated to the library. It's been published, and then it goes into the library, and it's not in use. But with this technology now, we can move it out of the library, and we can make it about all about one single person. And that's you. Thank you. Uh, for some questions now? OK, great. Uh, I'm curious about the rate among the general population for which you think that genetic testing can uncover uh, I guess traits where there is actionable advice for how to avoid disease. Like in the case of uh, cardiovascular disease, it's my understanding that there are some very rare genetic conditions that obviously it would be great to test for, but more commonly it seems to be lifestyle factors that are responsible for it. Right. So uh, two parts of that question. The question was asking about um, how many really common diseases uh, that we could do something about can we test for now? Uh, is it only really just a rare diseases, uh, possibly rare cardiovascular diseases can we test for? Are there really the common ones uh, that, that we could learn something about and, and have that be actionable? Uh, and the answer is that there's actually a large number right now that, that we can test for that are common that is actionable. So we mentioned a lot of different types of cancer from breast cancer, colon cancer, skin cancer, prostate cancer, those so the big four, 
uh, except for lung cancer, which we know is mainly uh, attributed to smoking, that it has much less of a genetic uh, effect. Uh, so those are all highly actionable. If we even learn that a baby is at risk, we can add preventions throughout life. For cardiovascular disease, we've seen this example with heart attack. Uh, that heart attack analysis, where we saw that person was close to 70 percent, that was based on a large number of genes. So we're not just looking at one gene that has a small degree of risk. We're looking at a lot of different genes. All of them have small risks. But together, when a person has a lot of different small risks, that adds up and starts to build upon itself. So that does enable us to see very high risks in people, uh, even if they don't have those rare conditions. So even if they have just the more for common forms of cholesterol buildup and, and heart attack risk. Uh, and the same thing with Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease has stolen the minds of an entire generation. And many of us fear that that will be our fate. Uh, we can now predict uh, uh, risk of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and we could do that quite well. Uh, and we can enact prevention. So there's no way to, to stop Alzheimer's disease, but there are ways, clear ways, to slow it down tremendously from ever occurring. So that if we just push it back 10 years, instead of affecting a person when they're 75, starts when they're 85, that's a large number of, of years, golden years, that they have to live that are healthy instead of sick. And also, with a large um, amount of money put in towards research, towards pharmaceuticals that are working to actually cure uh, diseases like Alzheimer's, those 10 years may be all that a person really needs to stay healthy until a new medication comes out. So it's buying time for a large number of people. So there are a large number of common diseases, and there, it also falls into the spectrum of autoimmune diseases, uh, blood clotting disorders, a lot of useful information um, that, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people think that it's just uh, cystic fibrosis, or it's just Tay-Sachs disease, or it's just the dilated cardiomyopathy that I mentioned. But just recently, it really has expanded out to include a large number of actionable common diseases. Yes. Hi. Um, uh, I'm curious to know how static is a person's genetic profile as they grow, as they age? Does it, does it change? Or, or once you've taken a profile of a person when they were a baby, does that hold when they're still, let's say, older? So the question uh, is, does the genetic makeup of a person, the genetic profile, does that change with age? So if uh, we mentioned the example of baby Emily, she had genetic testing when she was a baby. If she had genetic testing again when she was 50 years old, would that information change? Would that raw data change? And the raw data, so the, the letters themselves do not change. From the moment of conception to the moment of death, those raw data, those letters of the genetic code are the same. There are things around our genes that turn genes on and off. Those change. It's called the epigenome, epigenetics. But the raw data, what we're able to acquire now with the DNA chip, with whole genome sequencing, that does not change. So with whole genome sequencing, if we sequence a newborn, we get those six billion letters they really never need to have a similar type of genetic test again. That they have all, we have all that data, it's all there. Now it all comes down to analysis and reporting of that information. But, but a follow-up question is, will their propensity sure. to certain diseases change because certain markers come on or off based on the environmental stuff that they are, they are dealing with? So, so the propensity uh, for disease based upon just the raw data will not change. But it, their propensity will change because um, the, almost all of these common diseases, the heart disease, the cancers, Alzheimer's, it's not either only genes or only environment. It's a combination. So by learning about our genetic risk, we're able to modify our non-genetic risk factors, so our lifestyle, medications, foods we eat, exercises we do. So that will change the, the total risk. Now. Um, what if people go, let, let's say if a person goes and smokes, that will turn on and off certain genes that are, that are protecting or, or increasing a person's risk of cancer. So they can modify if genes turn on and off, but not the raw data, not those letters themselves. That is going to stay the same. Yes. Yeah, my question is around the accuracy of genetic testing and actually identifying sure. whether something that somebody's predisposed to is going to manifest itself. 
uh, right. versus somebody who's not predisposed to it in genetic testing coming out. So if you took 10 people who you've identified through testing that might have something, what's the likelihood right. that they'll actually end up showing it versus 10 random people? Right. So the question is about the accuracy of genetic testing data. Are these predictions that are being made, those risk predictions, how accurate are they? Uh, and the accuracy is really disease dependent, disease or trait dependent, that it differs uh, depending on the amount of research that's been conducted about those genes that are associated with that disease. So for diseases like heart attack, for diseases like Alzheimer's, for many types of cancer, for even many types of autoimmune diseases, the accuracy is very high right now. For other diseases like brain cancer, pancreatic cancer, different, different types of the rare cancers, uh, the accuracy is quite low, that we only have a few markers and, and they're not very predictive. Now, it's true that over time, these predictions are going to only improve, that we're going to learn that there are more genes. We're going to integrate that into the analysis. So the analysis is going to change. But that's true of all of medicine, that there's no component of medicine that is locked, that is concrete. Medicine is always changing. It's always evolving. And genetics and predictive medicine is no different. And as, as an example, uh, CPR was practiced one way for about 100 years. And just recently it came out that that was not the correct way, that it could be done better. So the CPR guidelines were completely modified, and now that old way is no more, and we have a new method for CPR. So that doesn't mean that CPR, that all the people who were performing CPR in the 60s and 70s and 80s should have never been doing it. It just means that as part of medicine, we know that things are going to improve and they're going to get better over time as more and more research comes out. That will certainly happen with genetic testing as well. Okay. Oh, well, it's two. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the first question I wondered is, for some of these rare diseases, now that you're able to test people who don't suspect they would have a rare disease, are you finding that they're more common? Or is it kind of upholding the original estimates? Uh, so we're finding that uh, a lot of times it is more common uh, in terms of people who carry those those diseases, just because we never before had the ability to, to actually screen for those. So we're, we're finding that people do carry uh, some of the more common rare diseases like Tay-Sachs or cystic fibrosis. We're identifying them and then I'm saying, well, I, my family has never had a case of that. I had no idea that that was in my in my genes. Uh, and according to statistics, because all this really was just based upon uh, statistical computations in the, in, the, in the past in terms of saying, well, this many people have it, so therefore we could uh, suspect that this many people probably carry it. Uh, but we're, we're finding out that those rates are a bit higher now. Okay. Yeah, but we're, we're, we're also right at the beginning of this, so we're just unlocking that door in terms of the number of people with rare diseases and, and identifying them and counseling them on ways to avoid, uh, avoid uh, harming future generations. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you. I guess sure. the last question then is, you've probably sold a bunch of us on getting our whole genome mapped, right. but what do we do? I, I've talked to my geneticist and he's like, well, it's going to cost you a couple thousand dollars. Insurance probably won't cover it. Do you have any advice for us? Right, so there are uh, two components. And the, the question was um, that you're interested in genetic testing. You want to uh, potentially get your whole genome sequenced. Uh, where can you go for this? And what's the advice surrounding having this be actionable now? So in terms of genome sequencing, uh, that is still in the thousands. So that's getting all six billion letters. Some individuals are doing that now, but it's still really uh, very much in the research realm, that they're using uh, research participants. Uh, for people who are true techies that have the money, then yes, they're, they're able to get their whole genome now. Um, the issue is being able to analyze and, and use that information, rather than just have it be cool that you have your whole genome. So uh, if, if you are interested in that, then a lot of geneticists, doctors, they could go through a company, this company like uh, Illumina down in San Diego, with, which is an excellent company that provides uh, sequencing uh, and has done it before for clinicians and actually detected some, some rare diseases in children and saved their lives with this technology. There are other companies, too, that have gone public recently, Complete Genomics and Pacific Biosciences, that also provide that service. There's Life Technologies also in San Diego, provides ion torrent service. 
Uh, so there are a lot of services out there. Even GE is working on on a technology, and IBM as well. So, so you Googlers need to get on the sequencing too. Uh, so the sequencing is a, a bit a, a way off. I see it being probably about two years off from when it's really cost effective and useful uh, on on a, on a clinical level. Uh, but the DNA chip now is is accessible to all of you. So uh, whether it's a Nexus DNA chip, which we make only available through a professional, whether it's a fitness trainer uh, or your doctor or your, your geneticist. Any doctor around the world uh, could now go and, and order this testing uh, through us. Uh, or it could also be, let's say you prefer to not go through a professional, you could go online to a company like 23andMe uh, and you could order genetic testing as well. Uh, the difference is you look at the reports, all, most of these companies have sample reports he looks at, at you look at the types of information and the different types of diseases because they don't test all for the same ones and you see what is most important to you what you want to get out of it and then you can decide what is the best service do you really want a professional involved and if so then that kind of narrows it down to the certain companies that will provide that service uh, or do you only want to go over the internet and just get it personally and that also narrows it down to to companies sure Thank you.